name is Conte Creamy. Um, right now I'm living in Montgomery, Alabama, and I give the history, the history, the untold history that's usually hidden uh, about the civil rights movement, bus boycott, slavery, and the Confederates. Uh, because I feel like people should know, not only that, I'm trying to get my own tour business started, the walking man store guy. Right now we're standing at Court Square. And each and every last one of these buildings, except for the Renaissance Bank building, has history to do with civil rights movement, bus boycott, slavery, and the Confederacy. The building of Brown building over on the corner, that, are, are you recording on something? Okay. That building is not the original building, it's a bank on the bottom two floors, government building on the top. The original building that was there was the Colonial Hotel. The Colonial Hotel was used as a temporary Confederate White House for Jefferson Davis. They used to hold slaves in the basement part of the Colonial Hotel. And this building over here, when it was originally built on the other side of the county, that was the slave market. And they used to hold slaves in the basement part of that building. From the Colonial Hotel, Jefferson Davis wrote a letter. The letter made its way over to the winter building. And from that letter, the first telegraph was sent out to stop the Confederate War, not just to stop the Confederate War, but to attack Fort Sumter. And over a period of years on the slave trade era, over 2,500 slaves were hung from the original parapet of the Winter Building. This building behind me was the Central Bank. The Central Bank was the only building with a metal front at that time, and it, and it helped to fund the CSA or the Confederates with loans, and then they went bankrupt. The building on the other side of the fountain, as I said, was a slave's market, not where they sold slaves, but where the indentured servants and the household slaves used to go and get their payment. Never in money. You give somebody enough money, they can buy their freedom. Always in something you can grow, wheat, corn, beans, that type of thing. The fountain was completely hollow. It was called the pit. They used to sell livestock and cotton outside the fountain and over here in this park area during the slave trade era. They, they were in the marketplace where they sold fresh fruits and produce. Over 1,200 slaves were killed inside that fountain, some for being disobedient, some for trying to escape to freedom. Like I said, it was called the pit. People used to look down inside there. There was no stage area. They used to look down inside of there in order to critique the slaves that they wanted to auction. Off, um, what, that they wanted to auction, sell, or trade off so that they can buy them. The normal bid for a slave, well, the slaves used to walk up Commerce Street through a tunnel and brought up inside the town. They were not allowed to walk on the top of the street during the day because the people did not want to see them on top of the street at the same, at the same time that they walked. The, the slaves used to stand around inside the town for 14, 15 hours a day without food or water. They became worn out and fatigued. As I said, the normal bid for us, they were $1,500. They were getting low bids, three, five to $700. And the cheapest slave that was ever sold there was actually sold for $250. So what they did was they washed up and cleaned up the healthy and the stronger looking slaves, and they were able to get the $1,500, $3,000, if you check the archives, up to $5,000 for a healthy, strong slave. And a lot of people said to me, I said, that's a lot of money back then. That's a lot of money now, but a lot of money back then. I said, yeah, but they didn't always buy slaves. We have a healthy, strong male and a healthy, strong female. Slaves were not considered human. They were considered products, like cattle. They were bringing together and made them so that they can create a healthy, strong child. These rocks. These rocks are not the original rocks. The original rocks came from Denmark. Late 1700s, early 1800s. They were used, came in big boulder form before they were broken down. They were used as balancers to keep the slaves from going. Because at one time, they used to have to walk slaves across country. And it was costly and they lost a lot of slaves. So they decided to use the steam engine boats. The, the steam engine boats. The Alabama River used to come all the way up to the corner where the Renaissance Hotel is. Until they put dams in place to lessen the water. The Alabama River was actually called at one time the Black Trail. Because they used to bring the slaves into the port of New Orleans, Mississippi, Florida. Selma, Florida, Mobile, Selma, and then up here to the riverfront. Jefferson Davis, when he was inaugurated into office, he sat at that Confederate capital, the one in Montgomery. The Alabama state flag is actually one of the flags that the Confederates used before they settled on the one that they had. 
Jefferson Davis also was a not when he had his inauguration ball. There's a building right next to the Crest Building where the Eagle that's stooping over. That building was is a very old building. It's the only building down here that had a glass dome. That's where Jefferson Davis had his inauguration ball. Rosa Park, first of all, Rosa Park was arrested on December 1st, 1955, sitting on the bus. It wasn't for sitting on the bus. She was arrested for disorderly conduct because when they asked her to remove her seat, she was sitting on the front seat of the black section. She was asked to remove herself from that seat. And it's recorded that when the bus driver asked her, he said that you, he, he was gonna call the police. She said, well, do that. And that's what she was arrested for, disorderly conduct, for not removing herself. There were four other women who were ostracized for actually sitting on the bus. The main one that we hear more about is Claudette Colvin. She was 16 years old, young, pregnant. And she was ostracized for sitting on the bus and arrested for that. Rosa Park caught the bus right here at this park. There was a turnaround and was arrested at her library in the all this coincided at the same time with Martin Luther King Jr. Giving, giving the reins over to lead the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. was not the first one to sit to lead the civil rights movement. And there was a walk before that that we don't, we don't hear much about and wasn't televised and nobody knows where, how far they got. Martin Luther King Jr. met with, a, with an organization, uh, MIA, MIA, at a black Episcopal church called Mount Zion. At the end of that meeting, he was named the president of that organization, and the man who was originally leading that organization became the vice president of our organization. <laughs> he was the one who organized the walks to sit in and the, uh, and the bus boycott. At that time, when he finished with the meeting, at the, the meeting at the, the church with the MIA, he was given the reins over the lead of the civil rights movement. Rosa Park got out of jail on on uh, December 5th, 1955. Rosa Park actually walked with Martin Luther King. So I believe that all of this was done at that time to go ahead and bring about a change. It's only been 65 years. People act like it was hundreds of years ago, and we still have a long way to go. But do you really want to know how far and how deep, how really, really far and deep the slave trade really went? If you go from Court Square two blocks up towards the Confederate Capitol to the corner of North Lawrence and you go one block over to the corner of North Lawrence and Monroe, you'll see a sign on one side that says Slave Depot. On the other side it says Slave Trading Area. A Slave Depot is supposed to be a confinement type area for the slaves. It went further than that. It was a concentration camp type area, so when they conditioned slaves, they can auction sell the trade them without a problem. And when I say condition, it went further than that. They would take the alpha male and they would beat him profusely in that area and hang him and kill him in front of the weaker ones and keep the weaker ones in line. On the other side, they would, say, they would tell you that there were a lot of plantations all over Alabama. A lot of plantations in Montgomery, a big push of slaves, a whole lot of slavery, and a large slave trade going on. But at the bottom is the part that I try to tell people so that they will understand and they will know how far and they went. At the bottom, and like I said, you have to think along the lines they did. Slaves were not considered human, they considered property, ownership. At the bottom, a man named Howard L. Percy took over that area. He did not use it as a regular slave before a regular slave trading area. He used it to sell black boys and girls of all description into slavery. All description meant height, weight, size, strength, texture, color of hair, texture, and color of skin, intelligence, and compliance level. Compliance to us means simply if I tell you to do something, you do it without question. It went further with him. A man wrote a paper and he said, If I tell you to wiggle your big child, I'm not popping you, wiggle your big child. I don't have to point to that big toe, I don't have to tell him which big toe, I don't even have to look down at that big toe, but he's my property, he or she is my property, I can punish him anywhere I want to, if they did not do what I, exactly what I said do. You will do the big, wrong, big toe, I have the right to chop off your big toe, beat you within an inch of your life, until I decide to auction sell or trade you to someone else. But if I decide to keep you, I can do anything, anytime, anywhere, 
that I want you to because you're my property. You're not human. I have to build a set. I have paperwork to say that I own you. And that's the basic history of the slave. Now, they have a museum, a new large museum, Memorial of Peace and Justice. Down here in Montgomery, they call it the Lynching Museum. There were a lot of marches and protests because when they built that museum, that was one of the areas where they had the largest slave warehouse. A lot of slaves were punished and killed. When they graded the ground and tore down everything that was there, they found bones and the dirt. People protested the people from being put there, but they still put the memorial of peace and justice there. The people don't readily know if they weren't here or did not hear, read about it. Readily know that that's where one of the biggest slave warehouses were, and that's where they found bones. At any given time, you, they, when they grade any of these old buildings down here, old old places that are not monuments, they find bone in the dirt. Get your bone in the dirt. I don't know, it, it kind of, sometimes it bothers me, oh, a lot of times it bothers me, because I wasn't born and raised here, and as I moved down this way, I started being called certain things and treated a certain way, and I didn't know, I really didn't really know how to handle that, but when I started finding out the history, now I know why, but things have came a long way, and people have gotten a lot better. But we still have a long, long way to go. And then go ahead. God is going to have to do all the work because we can't do it. Gotcha. Man, I, I certainly appreciate uh, you giving us that history. Uh, would you let everybody know who you are, my friend? My name is Conte Freeman. Conte, well, my name is Jonathan. I'm from South Carolina. And the people really appreciate what you're doing out here today. Continue to do what you do, brother. God bless you. Love you, man.